Well, hello everyone. I, I'm Mark Henderson. For the past uh, three years or so, I, I have been acting as tutor or facilitator of the uh, writing group in Chapel End of Frith, the capital of the peak. Uh, just recently, we have been working on uh, some items that we're going to put forward to the Buxton Festival Fringe this year. The Festival Fringe will have to be virtual for obvious reasons, but in particular we put down some poems about our experience in lockdown, the before, during and after, uh, and we've been telling uh, each other some invented folk tales, because a few weeks ago we had a look at the difference between a, a traditional orally communicated folk tale and a written story, and then we all went off and tried to write our very own folk tales. So this afternoon uh, we have uh, Pete Stelling who's going to uh, uh, is going to read some of his poems, his limericks. Um, Simone Hubbard, who is doing all the Zoom recording and YouTube connection for us, uh, is going to uh, tell her uh, folk tale. Anne Cawthorn is going to read a lockdown poem written by Kate Bryant. Um, Kate doesn't do Zoom, um, so we, we do it for her. Uh, and then I shall read my own little folk tale bit at the end. Very well, enough of an introduction, except just to say that all our work will be put together in the form of a PDF document, which will be put on the Chapel Arts website and can be accessed, downloaded for free from there, along with these YouTube clips. Uh, from the, the Buxton Festival Fringe site. Okay, enough. Pete, over to you, Limericks. Here's the first one. There was a man in lockdown who thought he would act as a clown. He put it on Zoom and his ratings did boom and now he's a talk of the town. Number two. I'm shielding from COVID-19. Because I'm no longer a teen, I do social distance at the government's insistence. The last time I tested, I was clean. To travel by bus, I need mask. Trains too, what an onerous task. It's better by far to travel by car with coffee to go in a flask. Thank you. <laughs> No piece of chapel art writer's work is complete without some of Pete's limericks. <laughs> Thank you, Pete. Now, one of our folk tales. Simone Hubbard, uh, a, a folk tale which is actually based on a genuine Peak District folk tale, but very much her own take on it. Simone. Right, thank you. Hi, ladies dancing. On the ninth day of Christmas, my true love sent to me nine ladies dancing. Well, they were dancing until one fateful night. Forestine was the lady of the forest. She loved dancing, especially in the clearing away from the trees. The nine ladies who followed her had all heard the old wise tale that they'd be turned to stone for dancing on the Sabbath. But the Sabbath was the only day they could meet, and dancing was their passion. They weren't going to heed old wives' tales. Forestine led them into the forest. Radella, the elfin counsellor, spotted them and leapt out to block her way. Where do you think you're all going, dressed up to the nines in your long white robes? Forestine was annoyed. Radella, you know full well where we're going. Not that it's any of your business, so please move out of our way. Gulvig the head witch will turn you all to stone, snapped Radella. You're only jealous because you have two left feet, Forestine told her. The nine ladies giggled. Well, better two left feet than no feet at all, Radella replied and moved out of the way. Forestine and the nine ladies went on, gathering tree branches and twigs that they could then use to make a fire. It was growing dark over the forest. Mist swirled. They'd need light for their journey home, so they carried torches. 
Forestine led them to the clearing where Diana, goddess of the animals, was dispersing her little woodland friends before the ladies threw their firewood in the middle. She spoke softly. I'm not sure this is a good idea, Forestine, as tonight is All Hallows, All Hallows Eve. It would be better for you all to go straight home or sit quietly. Diana, my dear goddess, please don't worry, we'll be fine. We just need Fyra to light the wood. Fyra won't come tonight. She says dancing on the Sabbath when it's All Hallows Eve and a full moon is asking for trouble. She left you this to light your torches to go home. Diana passed a lit torch to Forestine, but Forestine used it to light the branches and the twigs that they'd collected. Diana shook her head and left. Then the ladies formed a circle round the blazing fire. Forestine stood in the middle, as near to the fire as she could, and tapped her drum gently and slowly. The ladies began to move to the rhythm, twisting and turning, lifting their arms in the air. They chanted quietly at first. Then Forestine's tapping grew faster, and the ladies danced faster and leaped higher. The drum beat grew louder, the, the chanting grew louder, the ladies started to strike their hands together in time to the drum. But in the distance, a storm was brewing. Forestine slowed the drum beat and the ladies slowed their dancing. The storm grew closer, the wind rose, it blew their robes. Their long hair became tangled, autumn leaves swirled around them. The embers of the fire flew away into the menacing darkness and the wind smothered them and blackness engulfed the dancers. Forestine could feel and hear the wind, but she could see nothing. Then came a huge crack of thunder and a blinding lightning bolt. For a few minutes she was blinded and deafened. Then the storm died as quickly as it had risen. The sky was green. A bright light shone over the forest. It shone onto the clearing. The ladies had vanished. Nine stones surrounded Forestine. From far away, she could hear the cackling of Gulvig and the other witches. Forest no Forestine noticed she was standing on a flat stone in the middle of the circle. In the strange green light, she could see writing on it. There are none so blind as those who will not listen. Consumed with grief, she fell to the ground. Whoa. Oh, what a lovely sinister build up that had. And I particularly liked the green light at the end where the storm gave rise to the aurora. Um, yes, nice one, Simone, thank you. Thank you. Well now, one of the lockdown poems, and this is really quite a change of, of mood. Um, Anne, uh, you're kindly going to read this one from Kate, aren't you? Thank you. Stokesay Castle, Before, During and After, by Kate Bryant. We sat in the disguised bailey of this doll's house castle, surrounded by lawn and flowers, the air thick with the scent of lavender, and the late spring sun hot on our backs. All around us was the sound of blackbird and rook and rustling leaves, and the voices of tourists exploring Stokesay's secrets. To our left stood the South Tower, hunched, grey and solid, once home to the castle guard, now a refuge for bats. Before us lay the Shropshire Hills, cloaked in trees, my friend sat beside me, enchanted by the tiny castle. This was her first visit, but I felt like I'd come home. Now the buildings are deserted, except for the lone gardener perched on his mower or digging up dandelions. No sound of people talking, laughing. The only visitors are the birds and bats and the breezes that buffet the towers, and the gardener 
maintaining his space for no one to see. After the all clear, when people emerge from their homes once more and venture, perhaps nervously into the world beyond, will they return to Stokes eh, to explore and photograph and delight in its smallness? Or will our behaviour be changed, each watchful of coughs and wary of closeness? Will my friend come with me again to the miniature castle and the valley, where bats swoop in the falling light and the air is full of lavender? Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Anne. When I talked to Kate about that poem, um, I told her I shared her love of Stokesy Castle. Uh, I, I discovered it many years ago, and I've, I've been several times since. It, it really has a great atmosphere about it. English Heritage has done a good job with it. OK, so now that leaves me to tell a story um, uh, with a folk tale feel about it, but very obviously a very modern setting. It is called The Rock Piper. Raymond Stoll was full of music. He longed to join a rock band and share his genius with the world. He, he was a, a virtuoso on the air guitar, sending imaginary audiences of thousands into raptures with its dazzling riffs. But he was less accomplished on solid guitars. Practice failed to make him perfect, and his singing voice was neither strong nor accurate. He took lessons, joined classes to network with other performers, but they were all indifferent, except for kind-hearted Jack. And kind-hearted Jack was the lead singer of a locally popular band called Gothic Jelly. And Raymond loved Gothic Jelly, latter-day prog rock with touches of heavy metal. He, he attended every gig. He yearned to join them on stage, but not even kind-hearted Jack could encourage him. Raymond searched for ads and notices in music stores and at venues, went to open mic evenings and jam sessions. No one was interested. He visited websites, band mix, Gumtree, Jam Kazam, advertised through Craigslist, searched social media platforms, SoundCloud and Bandcamp, posted videos on YouTube. None of it helped. Kind-hearted Jack offered better lessons, but Raymond didn't improve. Perhaps you should try a different instrument, Raymond. So Raymond tried a bass, but the results were no better than with his guitar or his singing. Then he tried a drum kit, but was handicapped by a poor sense of rhythm. His dreams would never be realised. He went for a country walk to escape his sorrows. The breeze sang in the trees, a brook sang through its little valley, birds sang everywhere. The world was full of music, and his head, his soul, was full of music, as it always was. But while the world poured out its joys and sorrows in glorious sound, Raymond's music stayed locked inside him. He paused at a sile, its dial beside a bridge over a stream, and sat. Too long. Then something in the grass caught his eye. He, he picked it up. A set of panpipes. He, he dusted it off and raised it to his lips. And the music inside him poured out. The, the breeze changed its tune to harmonise with his, and the birds sang along with him. The, the, the stream played a backing. He'd read somewhere that a band can attract more attention if it uses an unusual instrument. Jack, listen, listen. He played and kind-hearted Jack's jaw dropped. He picked up his guitar and played a take on Raymond's melody. He sang words to it. Oh, with me, he said. Within an hour, Raymond was playing with Gothic Jelly. On the Saturday evening, he joined them in a pub gig. When they saw a young man with panpipes and a prog rock gig, everybody laughed. But then the sound of those pipes rose over the guitars, the bass, the percussion, and the songs gained new and mesmerising dimensions. The pub crowd fell silent. 
more and more people poured in from adjoining bars and stood enraptured, the music carrying them to lands of dreams. Four weekends and four gigs later, Gothic Jelly had a recording contract. Their album went platinum. Every music critic, every journalist, every Radio 1 presenter poured out accolades for Gothic Jelly and their amazing panpiper. There were international tours. Pictures of Raymond and his panpipes appeared in adverts, at concert venues, on teenage girls' bedroom walls. Oh, he needed a rest. Back in England, he took his country walk again. At the stile beside the bridge, he sat and played. Once again, the breeze harmonised with him. The birds sang along with him. The stream played its backing. Hypnotised by his own Orphean brilliance. Raymond fell asleep. He woke alone. The panpipes had vanished. He searched and searched, but to no avail. No matter, he thought. The music shop was delighted to order the world's best panpipes for Raymond the superstar. But when he played the world's best panpipes, the sound was dull. Music no longer flowed from his soul. Gothic Jelly's performances became lacklustre. Critics grew harsh. Audiences thinned. Bookings became fewer. Within a year, Gothic Jelly were playing pub gigs again, and Raymond was no longer with them. They'd made one remarkable album, and it sold CD after CD, download after download. Raymond had a copy but he seldom listened to it. It evoked happy memories. It made him weep. And that is quite enough from me. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pete, who has now had to leave us to look after his chickens. Um, and Anne for reading Kate's poem. And Simone for that lovely story and for doing all the work of recording us. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.